Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Role of Microbes and Crop Residue in Soil Health Management, presented by Holganic. I'm Robin Sitberg of Meister Media Worldwide, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. This webinar has been approved for one-half CEU credit in soil and water management from CCA. To receive credit, you must watch the entire webinar, and there will be a QR code at the end of the presentation you can use to submit your credits. We will have time, as always, for some questions at the end of the webinar. So if at any time during the presentation you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and type it in your question pane at the lower left corner of your screen and, and go ahead and submit it. Um, you can do this at any time during the webinar and we'll answer questions at the end. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Dave Stark, President of Agriculture at Holganic. Dave joined the company in 2015 to lead its efforts in the agriculture space, including commercial development, R&D, and he oversees a variety of research studies. His past career includes leadership positions in Monsanto's technology and business unit. Dave holds a PhD in molecular biology and biochemistry from Washington University and has published 26 peer-reviewed scientific articles and holds nine patents. So he has a lot of information to share and I'm pleased to turn it over to Dave. Thanks, Robin. Thanks everyone for joining. So. Um... Yeah, that, that's kind of me. I'm, I'm a little older now, but hey, you know, we all cheat with our pictures. At least I, I can't help a little bit. In any event, there's a, so much I want to share, and I hope it doesn't come across overwhelming. Now, in all of my slides, I try to put a, a scientific reference and give you enough data so that you've got a reason to believe that I'm not just telling you things that are my opinion. I'm a, I'm a scientist by training. I can tell you my own journey along soil health. When I first joined Holganics, I only did it as a favor to a friend because Holganics was in the lawn and landscape business before that. I had just retired from Monsanto, and um, the Holganics wanted to get into agriculture, and I was asked to be a mentor. And when I found out that they sold micro microbes, I thought, those are bugs in a jug. I mean, the science around it is lousy. I don't want to do it. But I did because my friend Jeff asked, and our younger daughters were good friends. And so now, in the, the time since you know, 2015, we're starting to see a lot more investment in soil science. Boy, you'd think this, this is some, one of the first things scientists would have explored. It's not. But things are really starting to come together. So on this slide, and I hope you can see it, all these things going around that picture of soil microbes are things that the soil biology does. So what I want to do is give you enough reason to believe that even though there's a lot being thrown at you in terms of soil microbes, there's actually a lot of validity around why the biology in the soil is so important. So I want to help us dig through what to look for, because if you got have biologically healthy soil, just like if we have healthy biology in and on us, it plays a big role in our own health. Biology in the soil does so much. It actually is what makes the soil work. So I'm going to jump from different topics, you know, and, and give you an idea of what's going on. I'm going to start, though, with nutrient use efficiency, and this is a big one especially the last couple years, uh, because fertilizer prices have been so high. But even with them coming down, um, we still, generally speaking, if you've heard the line, you know, ha less than half the fertilizer you put on the crop actually goes to the crop, that's scientifically valid. Um, and if we think about, you know, 36% of the cost of producing corn is fertilizer, and this is a 2021 number from USDA, uh, we're, and it's a $20 billion a year market in the U.S., that's $10 billion plus of our dollars, you know, not doing what we want. So how can we approve nutrient use efficiency? So I usually talk about, you know, nitrogen-fixing bacteria because that's a hot one now. But, you know, that, that would to really get into it, it would take about five more minutes. I'm just going to say, yes. There are bacteria, like those that live in your root nodules, that can take nitrogen from the air and convert it into ammonia. There are some that are free living in the soil, um, and there are products around that. 
generally speaking, it is incredibly energy expensive to take nitrogen gas and turn it into ammonia. So it's very, very expensive. And when any microbe is trying to do that, they're not as competitive with everything else because they're all fighting for space and resources. So that's not to say those products don't work and can't work. They can, but there's a lot of technical challenges with it. Another way that I like to look at nitrogen use efficiency is summarized on this slide. So this slide is a, from a meta study. So what is that? Meta studies look at a topic in all of the published scientific research on that topic. So this study summarizes 230 published studies looking at nitrogen use efficiency in corn, rice, and small grains. There is a lot of science on this slide. What they're showing, that center box that has the black around it, if we don't have biologically active soil, we put fertilizer on the ground, some gets taken up by the roots, and a lot of it doesn't. It sits there, it erodes away, it washes away, it volatilizes, very inefficient. But in biologically active soils, what happens is most of the nitrogen need of the crop is not directly taken up by the fertilizer that's applied. It passes through microbes first. And that's what S-O-N turnover. You're going to see this. This is a secret a scientist have, but I'll share it with you. We like to come up with terms that only we understand so you think we're smart. <laughs> that's pathetic, but it's true. So S-O-N turnover, soil, organic nitrogen turnover, what does that really mean? It means you put fertilizer on the ground. If you have biology in the soil, then they eat it. So the microbes eat the fertilizer. Other microbes eat those microbes and spit that fertilizer back out to the plant. So it passes through a microbe. Why do we care? Because microbes immobilize the nutrients. They live within half an inch of a living root. So we get less loss to the environment, more going to the plant. Bottom line, biologically healthy soils produce greater corn yields per unit of fertilizer input. That's the bottom line. Now, there's a saying here I really like. I hope you remember. Remember this through my talk. Microbes mine the soil. Plants farm microbes. They actively attract and repel the microbes that do best in their root zone. However, this is funny. It's one of the hardest conversations I have with people. The microbes work best if we don't over apply fertilizer. So most of my customers, I tell back off your fertilizer rates and it's like yanking the teeth out of their head. It's hard, but if a plant senses excess nitrogen and phosphorus in particular, it won't spend the energy to attract the microbes. So they're no longer farming the microbes. So we gotta find that balance. Just to bring it, you know, this is another way that microbes feed plants. By the way, this, this is from uh, James White at, at Rutgers University. I took about two-thirds of the graphics off of this slide to simplify it, so you're welcome. <laughs> it's still pretty complex. This is cool. What it turns out is that when the plants and the microbes sense that there's a critical mass of microbes in the soil, it's called quorum sensing, and I'm going to show you pictures of this later. Things change in the soil. It also, one of the things that happens is it triggers the plant root tip to start eating microbes. It absorbs them. So the microbes are absorbed into the root tip. They strip off the cell wall, which has a lot of nutrients. Now, some microbes die. So now all the nutrients are released, not just nitrogen, P, K, all the microbes, et cetera. Other microbes, though, survive. They travel up the root, and you see the little buds with the arrows coming off? That's the bud where the root hair forms. They, the microbes secrete a hormone. It induces root hair formation. They travel out the root hair. They're spit back out into the soil. They remine the soil for nutrients because microbes grab nutrients the plant can't. 
and we cycle back again. So these are two ways, direct absorption of nutrients, you know, like I had on the last slide, and now absorption of nutrients by eating microbes that plants need biology. So I'm going to show you later, if you've got a plant that's got a lot of root hairs, it probably has some decent biology to trigger all of this. So again, I like these tests that cost nothing. All you need is a shovel. Um, same is true for P and K. So, you know, you get your soil test, you're probably looking at your available pools, they're tiny. Most soil has a lot of P and K. Years, decades, maybe even longer. But they're in chemical forms the plant roots cannot access. This is another reason, though, why plants farm microbes, because microbes can. They tap into that total pool. And in fact, um, you know, we can see that, you know, the, the phosphorus in the top six inches of soil, if it's healthy soil, there's a lot more in the microbes than even in the plants. So this works for P and K as well. So by the way, if someone is selling you a product that's a microbial, then they say it can unlock phosphorus or potassium. That's credible because microbes do this. Uh, now we go to the next slide. So again, we're talking about nutrient use efficiency, microbial activity keeps NPK and everything else in the root zone. Now there's a lot of products out there that also induce rooting. And this makes sense again because the root zone is the home of the microbes. So there are microbes that secrete hormones that induce roots. They want a bigger home. They want more food. And I've had a lot of guys say, you know, I use this product or that product. I saw more roots. I just didn't see any more yield. It's still important. So from a nutrient use efficiency standpoint, the soil with any given root zone, the roots are only exploring about 1%. And if we think about how a lot of nutrients need to be in close proximity to a root to be absorbed, if we have more roots and more root hairs, we're exploring more soil, so we're getting better nutrient use efficiency. So roots do matter. Second, and I'm also going to show you pictures later, those roots are breaking up compaction. They're making channels for air and water. They're loosening up that soil. They're producing the glue that glues soil particles together that will resist compaction and hold water. It's the roots that contribute a lot more to stable organic matter than the stuff we leave on top of the ground. So roots are important. So don't discount a product that might be sold to you and all you get are roots. It matters. So quick process check. Microbes. Uh, and we'll talk next about what they are. Um, feed on fertilizer, uh, manure, uh, last year's crop residue, whatever. They immobilize it in the soil. And as long as we have biological diversity, those nutrients are cycled back. Um, also, plants can directly absorb microbes and obtain nutrients that way. So I keep saying microbes, microbes, microbes. What am I talking about? So here's the main different types of microbes, and I'm gonna show you pictures here in a minute of each kind. So the smallest, the most abundant, the fastest to grow, and frankly, what's gonna get the first bite of any food source, any nutrient, any fertilizer or bacteria. And there can be over a billion in a gram of soil. Um, actinomycetes are a lot like bacteria. You can see, uh, again, a very uh, uh, plentiful, then you go down to fungi, protozoa, amoeba, nematodes, and yeah, there are a lot of beneficial nematodes. All of these are required to do everything I talked about in terms of the soil health and nutrient cycling. So they're all important. So if you look at the biomass, that column on the right, pounds per acre, there can be a couple tons of bacteria. Uh, there can be over six tons, almost seven tons of fungi. Fungi are a lot bigger. They're less numerous, but they're, they're just larger in size. Or look at the other end of the extreme. There can be almost none. And this is what we see. We do a lot of soil testing. Fungi, protozoa, amoeba, that's what tends to be missing in a lot of farmed fields. And, uh, and we'll talk about why that is. And I'll tell you, 
you know, we'll, we'll talk about each one. I'm going to use nitrogen cycling as an example. I think it's just a beautiful example of, of how God designed soil to work. And, you know, I say that deliberately. And, you know, I'll just take a little aside. So what is a molecular biologist? Well, we're experts in DNA. So, you know, I, I was trained and I know uh, molecular evolutionary theory really well 20, 30 years ago. I probably would have said, isn't it amazing how evolution put all this together? Now, I got to tell you, what I'm about to say is not because I came to faith. I you know, had Jesus as my Savior as long as I can remember. I'm following the science, just like I am in the soil. The science is telling me how embarrassed I should be to ever believe that random processes can come up with the absolute mind-boggling, elegant complexity we see even in simple life forms. So as you see everything that I'm, I'm going to show you, just keep in mind, this isn't an accident. It, it, mathemat, mathematicians have a term. They call it absurdly impossible. This is absolutely designed. And frankly, following the data, if you want to know why we're here, the best available explanation I find in Genesis chapter 1. So let me talk a little bit more about why, you know, what this elegant complexity. So here's a picture in the top in the green. Those are a picture of bacteria. The one on the bottom, the kind of orangish, that's a close-up of actinomyces. They're really not that much bigger than bacteria. They do come in different shapes and sizes. Again, they induce rooting. They eat organic matter. Bacteria dominate tilled ground. Um, and we're going to talk about this. And there's a concept here I want you to remember because it's a common theme. It's called carbon to nitrogen ratio. And it's really important in understanding why all this biology matters, uh, including when we talk about breaking down crop residue. For every nitrogen atom in a bacteria, there's about five carbons. Why do we care? Well, as a biologist, I will tell you that is an extremely high nitrogen requirement. They're pigs. They eat your nitrogen, and they hang on to it. Most products that are out there that people are selling are bacteria. They're easy to grow. They're easy to apply. They're easy to stabilize. So they work well for the manufacturer. Now let's talk about fungi. And I'm not talking about yeast. You know, unicellular fungi, yeast are great. They're even good in the soil. They're even better for making beer and wine. Um, I'm talking about the yeast that produce that long, white, fuzzy stuff you see in the picture. Those are the, the yeast hyphae that then band together to form mycelia. Fungi degrade crop residue and organic matter better than anything else in the soil. Everything I'm talking about can, but the fungi do the best job. They eat bacteria. Um, they're really, really good at unlocking nutrients, especially phosphorus. And you can see, because of the size, they get in between soil particles. Even the tiny hairs on your uh, plant roots can't reach. So fungi like mycorrhizae will increase the effective surface area of a plant anywhere from 100 to 1,000 fold. Think of now the soil we're exploring. But fungi, while they live long, they're kind of wimpy. They need a stable environment. When we till, imagine how we chop up all that white fuzzy stuff. So we really set them back. Fungi also have to have oxygen. Their carbon to nitrogen ratio is three times lower than bacteria. So one nitrogen for 15 carbons. Now let's go to the next ones, protozoa, amoeba, and nematodes. By the way, that picture in the, in the, on the right side, kind of halfway down, that is a nematode eating what I believe is a soybean cyst nematode. So there are, these are all predators. So protozoa, amoeba, eat everything, eat each other, organic matter, but especially bacteria. So a single protist can eat 10,000 bacteria a day. If you think back to that chart I showed where there can be a billion bacteria in a teaspoon of soil, and there's only, you know, thousands or, or, you know, far, far less protozoa. Remember, that's good. They eat 10,000 a day. So it's keeping them in balance. All of these must have oxygen. Now, look at the carbon to nitrogen ratio. 
not one to five, it's one to 30. So what's happening? So these protists eating 10,000 bacteria a day that are very nitrogen rich, that nitrogen is toxic to them. It is for us too. We're about one to 30 as well. So when we eat a steak, if you ever thought that not to be indelicate, but if urine and urea sound similar, they are. <laughs> That's us getting rid of nitrogen. Same thing happens here. But when protozoa and amoeba get rid of nitrogen, they spit it out in the form of ammonia and nitrate. Where? Well, where do the bacteria live? Next to a root. What two forms of nitrogen do your plant roots take up the most readily? Nitrate and ammonia. The cycle's complete. You need all the biology. So people will ask me, I, I've got really good soil. Do I need to use a, you know, a, a diverse biological product every year? I'm telling you, the soil biology changes constantly. Some things we do, like I said, tilling really sets back the fungi. You get a bacteria-dominant ground. Over-fertilization means the plants aren't farming the microbes anymore. Uh, certainly chemicals like fumigants sterilize everything and some fungicides, but some things we have no control over. Winter, you know, microbes are full of water. When water freezes, it expands. That kills a lot of microbes. Not all of them the same, though. So we throw the balance out, and we need the balance to cycle everything right. Flooding is another bad one. Remember, they need oxygen. 48 hours underwater, the oxygen is depleting. We're losing our fungi, protozoa, amoeba. We're getting some bacteria to survive. And you can tell when this happens. Because when the water drains, you smell it before you see it, like the bottom of a swamp. That's really bad. That through time, that land will recover, but it's not anywhere near the biological activity that we want to really do what soil should but just to make things more complicated. <laughs> it depends what you grew in the field the year before and what you're growing now. Six to 10% of the microbes that are farmed by the plant not only differ between corn and soy and wheat and oak trees, they, they differ six to 10% between corn hybrids, between soybean varieties. So the soil is built to be diverse. And there's frankly a lot we still need to learn. So look, I'm gonna issue an apology. I'm a scientist, I'm not a sales guy. Most of my slides show pictures with our product, but just substitute biologically diverse product. What you want is something that has bacteria, fungi, protozoa and amoeba. You want all of it. So what does a product like that look like? Well, it's not a powder and it's not a liquid that's in a tightly sealed jug. You can keep at room temperature unless you can only keep it for a week or two. Remember, these are living microbes. Almost all of them will not form a spore. And if you dry them down, you're going to set a lot of them back. So you're looking for things that are like compost teas. And there are different compost tea kits. A product like ours is kind of an engineered compost tea. It's based on the process, but it's very deliberate in how we change conditions throughout our manufacturing process so we know exactly which types of microbes we are producing throughout. When we actually DNA fingerprint everything at the end and so we know every one of them, we actually do that through a third-party lab. So go for diversity. Um, so if we look at what diverse microbes can do, this is a turf study. So this is looking at turf performance. This is a summary of about 28 studies done at North Carolina State, Penn State, and Purdue. And it's showing huge reductions in fertilizer. It's never, ever the case that the plant needs less fertilizer. It's always because the biology is keeping more in the root zone, feeding it back to the plant. Now, if you use a diverse biological product, please do not cut your fertilizer 75%. When we remove a crop, we remove nutrients. We need to put them back. This is a tool that will help you dial in in your operation what works best. And here's another way of looking at it. So this is a study last year from Iowa. 
looking at 5 to 20% fertilizer reductions. And I've got other studies like this. So this is just, you know, an, an example of one that, that's, that's pretty representative. And you can see in every case, we, the, the yield is better than the check. Now, which one you would do really depends upon the price of corn and the price of fertilizer. Again, it's a tool to help you dial in what works best for you in your operation. Uh, this is a pasture in Alabama. This is the same field. The whole thing was reseeded with fescue. The top two pictures are a few weeks apart, only watered. The bottom two, again, different part of the same field, water plus microbes. Look at the difference. This tells me, first of all, the ground has very little biological activity because without adding microbes, not much happens. It also tells me there's fertility in that ground because when the microbes are added to unlock it, look what happens. I love this slide because all it cost was a little bit of someone's time and a shovel, and we can learn a lot. So this is comparing uh, a diverse microbial product, starter fertilizer, and one of the products that is a, a nitrogen-fixing bacteria that lives in the soil. And I'm not going to say which one. It doesn't matter. So the grower, when he dug these up, said, look, the ones that have all three, that has the diverse biology, the plant's taller, it has better color, and a lot more root hairs, stronger brace roots. And if I could really zoom in on these pictures for you, you would see a huge difference from the left three as you, and then going across to the right in terms of the numbers of root hairs, there's almost none. So if we look at the right, the starter fertilizer only, we see a lot of bare roots, no root hairs, and very little dirt sticking to the roots. What that tells me is this ground is not very biologically active. Remember, if we have diverse biology, the, the plant root is now eating microbes. Some of those microbes induce root hair formation. Um, adding one or two species of a nitrogen-fixing bacteria there in the middle doesn't fix the problem. But when we have diverse biology, now we have root hairs, and look at the dirt stuck to the roots. That's called the rhizosheath. That's so important because that's where all the action happens. Nutrient exchange, um, if you were having nitrogen-fixing bacteria, it would happen there. Um, it also forms a, a protective barrier against uh, loss of water. So again, you can just see a lot just from the picture. <clears throat> so now we're gonna change a little bit in our nutrient discussion to what you do with crop residue. So there's a, you've got decisions to make with your residue. You know, you can pull it off the farm, use it as feed, uh, maybe as a biofuel source, you can leave it out there. So if we just take corn, for every 40 bushels of corn, there's about a ton of stover produced. So your 200 bushel an acre corn crop, there's five tons of residue out there. In each ton, 17 pounds of nitrogen, four pounds of phosphorus, 34 pounds potassium. Potassium is a big part of stalks and stems helping to give strength, and some sulfur. So these are nutrients you've already bought and paid for. Not a single speck is ever available unless a microbe breaks it down to a basic chemical form the plant root can absorb. So let's think about now carbon to nitrogen ratios and some of the problems with this. So remember, if you're in a tilled field, you're bacteria dominant or if you're using different products, um, you're trying to break down uh, with bacteria that has one nitrogen for five carbons, corn stover, one for every 55 to 60. Wheat is one to 80, wheat and other small grains. These are very nitrogen poor substrates for microbes. So what can happen? Even if you put nitrogen down, you can still have corn that emerges that's yellow. And I bet if you do a soil test, you're going to find nitrogen out there, but it's in the bacteria. It's not being unlocked because the bacteria that are trying to degrade this, and even to an extent the fungi, they got to borrow the nitrogen from somewhere, so they're taking it from the ground. So when I look at different products that are to break down crop residue, 
and I'm not going to name company names or products by name. I, I hate that. That's not my job. My job, I just look at what's out there so that you can make the best decision for your operation. So we make a product that's fungal rich. And remember, it's fungi that can break down the cellulose and the lignin. And I usually show you pictures of those. And my my uh, analogy is cellulose is like rebar. Lignin is like concrete. They, that cellulose and lignin together is what makes a 100-foot-tall tree stand up to a 90-mile-an-hour crosswind. It's very strong. Lignin in particular is incredibly hard to digest. Fungi have the right biochemistry. So then I look at seven other products. All of them but one are just bacteria. It's only product B that says that they've got a decent number of bacteria and fungi. So I'm interested. I just can't find out what the fungi are. Um, is it really the ones that form there's mycelia or is it just yeast? I don't know. So that was frustrating. And then now let's look at, at corn. So if you look at the picture on the lower right. I mean, we've all seen this. A field a year or two after planting corn, and what do we see? Chopped up pieces of corn stalk. What is going on? So look at that circle kind of in the top middle, and that's a cross-section of corn stalk, that kind of light tan stuff called the pith. That's the majority of the volume of the stalk, but it's only about 11 to 12% of the weight. It's, it's light, it's watery, it goes away fast. It's those brown spots in the middle. Those are the pipes, the vascular bundles that bring nutrients and water up and down the plant in that outer ring called the rind. Um, it's not much in terms of the total volume, but it's 75% of the weight of a corn stalk is that outer rind. And it's triple the density of the pith of the inside because it's got the concrete and the rebar, the cellulose and the lignin in it. So this is a picture actually from a website of one of the products I, I spoke about. It's bacteria only. And they're showing off how their product works. But look, only the pith which is easy to digest, is gone. You can see the vascular bundles in the middle on the rind. Um, it's just not doing the job. Here's a product with fungi. This is 10 days after application. You can see in the right-hand picture the, the white, even the blue, uh, in the black fungus growing all through it. These things, by the way, will digest mostly from the inside out. And look, you can snap the stalk. It crumbles. 10 days, is, by the way, is fast. And it depends on conditions. So this is a picture from Iowa last fall. This is the same field. The whole thing was vertically tilled. And uh, on part of it, we have a product that has a lot of the right fungi to break down cellulose and lignin. Three weeks later, look at the difference. Now, again, I want to stress, any microbial product needs temperature and moisture. This is ideal. There was temperature and moisture, so we saw really de good degradation in this field. If, however, you're harvesting and you want to apply a microbial product to control residue and it's almost winter, so if you're in Iowa and you're close to Thanksgiving, unless you're going to have a really, really late fall, don't spend your money. Also, if you're bone dry and you're not even getting morning dew to wet the residue mat, don't spend your money. We need temperature and moisture. So, um, you know, where I lived for 36 years in St. Louis, we would have enough nice days in the winter. I wouldn't worry about it so much. Where I live now in Fort Wayne, Indiana, by Thanksgiving, there's no way I'm spending my money on this. Probably by the beginning of November, I'm thinking hard about it. So it really depends where you are. And then just wait till spring. So along this line, we've been seeing – when we use diverse biology, how easy it is for the soil to work. So if I go back to this page, you know, before the, the, the guy who owns this field said he's not going to chisel plow in the spring because he doesn't have a residue problem that's making his soil heat unevenly and such. He can actually, now he can no-till. But what they're also finding when they plow that they don't get the clods, that the ground works so easy. 
And so why is that? Well, this is another thing biology does. So soil compaction, and this is a quote. This is probably the only thing I'm going to read off any of my slides. The susceptibility of soils to compaction is the direct result of a biological problem. Decreased amounts of roots, fungal hyphae, and their secretions in the soil. It's a biological problem. So we all, and I used to think until I started reading some of this, that it's, you know, ground that might be wet and you have heavy equipment over it. Well, yeah, that, that contributes. But if we have soil structure, we resist it. So what builds soil structure? So you think of two different kinds of aggregates in the soil, you know, clay pieces, micro aggregates. Think of a jar that you fill with sand. You can pack that in pretty tight. Not a whole lot of air. Water infiltrates pretty slow. Now, fill that jar with large marbles. Water's going to go right into it. It's going to hold a lot of air. That's the difference between a micro and a macro aggregate. So how do we make a macro aggregate? Well, it's the exudates, the glue that's secreted by plant roots and fungi. Those two glues work together to glue the micro aggregates into macro. And the fungal hyphae, that white feathery stuff, along with plant roots, kind of works like a basket weave to hold everything together, to give it more stability. <clears throat> now, when we till, we break that up. And remember, that glue they make, bacteria love. It's good food for them. So when we till... Now we expose that food to more bacteria, so the food's gone, we lose our structure. So we need plant roots and fungal hyphae to really build soil structure. And this is just a picture. You can see the macro aggregate there on the right. It's kind of busy, but you can see it's big. It's surrounded by plant roots, fungal hyphae. We break it up. It becomes really small things, which you can see. You can just physically pack together real tight. So... Now, another thing I've learned, and I, I talk a lot about fungi, and so fungi not only helps build your soil structure and prevents, uh, and, and prevents and fights compaction, but fungi in particular give stress tolerance to the crop. So fungi in a few different ways, some just by finding water and nutrients, others by actually signaling the plant to turn on different stress response genes. Here's a great picture. This is Nebraska earlier in the spring, bone dry. Look at the difference of having biology with fungi on the right versus no biology and no fungi added on the left. So we got, again, the biology is driving deeper rooting, finding more water, and telling the plant, be ready because we're going to help you withstand drought. Um, last thing I, I think I'm going to cover is just real quick how microbes reduce insect damage. So this is something I've been told for years, you know, gosh, you know, and, and they asked me to explain it. And, you know, PhD is piled higher and deeper. You think I'm kidding? <laughs> That's another inside uh, reality. So now I understand because there's been research done. Microbes in the soil, and this is some fantastic work are far more important to giving the plant resistance to insect damage than the plant's own genetics. That blew my mind looking at that. How does it happen? First of all, if we have all this biologically active soil like I've been talking about, what are we doing to nutrient use efficiency and overall nutrient availability? It, in, we're improving it. So the plant has more access to nutrients. More nutrients means the sugar levels are higher in the leaves. And it's kind of opposite of my daughter's, but insects, a lot of them don't like sugar. As a matter of fact, the sugar in their gut draws the water out of their body into their gut and it kills them. So the insects go to weaker plants that have less sugars because they can handle it from a digestive standpoint. Another thing, we're going back to that lignin and cellulose, like in the rind of the corn stalk. 
a plant that has access to more nutrients and has the biology in the soil is triggering the plant to produce more lignin and cellulose in the leaf, and it has the nutrients to do so. That makes the leaf tough to chew, just like that rind is tough to break down. Insects don't like that. They go to the weaker plant uh, because it's easier to chew. And last, like I said, the, the microbes are just telling the plant, hey, you're under attack. Increase your own uh, defense genes. So here's just a picture, you know, using a diverse uh, microbial that, that's showing one application, how the bricks is going up significantly from four to five and a half. And also, you, you can see the F to B ratio. We're getting fungi in the soil now. And the soil carbon, food for microbes. You know, I'm not going to talk about carbon markets. You know, I hope you all get paid for what you do. You should. But um, the soil carbon is better. So, again, when you go for biology, go for diversity. And I just threw a lot at you. That's my email address. And I love answering questions. And, you know, whether you ever become a customer or not, that, that doesn't matter to me. I want you to make the right decisions for your operation. But no, diverse biology, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, amoeba, even beneficial nematodes can help you dial back your fertilizer, manage crop residue, actually build your soil structure so you open it up. Um, you'll have better stress tolerance. You'll see less insects and pathogens. All those things should lead to better yield, and your land is going to be more valuable. Now, let me finish, though, because I've given you a lot that sounds great. Biology, though, is only a component of your operation. It's not a silver bullet. There are living things. There are a lot of variables that affect it. So anything else you can do, if you can reduce your tillage, if you can do cover crops, whatever works in your operation, it's going to work with the biology. So this is not ever a standalone solution. It's just another tool in your toolbox that actually can be really, really important and doesn't have to be very expensive. So Robin, I am finished and I will be happy to take questions. All right. Well, I'm glad because we've gotten quite a few already, and I'd like to encourage anyone who hasn't submitted a question and they have one to go ahead and, and submit it now, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so I guess the first question here is, uh, do roots have the ability to take the actual microbes into the plant, or is it just the nutrient that the microbes yield that goes into the plant? No, in rhizophagy, they actually are absorbing the microbe. And we know they can absorb fungi and bacteria, and I suspect they can do protozoa, amoeba as well. So they're absorbing the entire thing, um, which, is, which is stunning. The work that James White did at Rutgers is, uh, is just elegant. Um, and so they can get all the nutrients in the microbes. Okay. All right. Okay, our next question oh, not, a little... I, Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. And I should be clear, that's only one way. So when, when like a protozoa eats a bacteria and spits out ammonia, nitrate, phosphorus, et cetera, the plant root can directly up, uptake those nutrients. So the plant root's doing both. Okay. All right. Good clarification. Um, all right, the next question is, I learned dirt is dead and soil is alive. I heard you saying dirt in the roots. Is that dead soil in the roots? You know, that's a great point because I, I have T-shirts that, that say, do you, have, do you have soil or do you have dirt? <laughs> so, no, when you say uh, <laughs> it's soil, and I really thank the person for that clarification because um, I'm, and I usually don't make that mistake. To me, I, I'm the same way. Dirt is dead. Soil is living. So that soil that's glued to the roots, the, the rhizosphere, the rhizo sheath, I'm sorry, that is soil. That is very alive. Okay. All right. The next question is a couple of parts. Um, it's how do you stabilize the bio 800 plus having fungi, protists, and bacterium? And do the sugars or are the sugars having an impact on this? And then in addition, so, are the results you are showing with or without conventional fertilizers? Okay. 
So the only way we have found to stabilize the product is we refrigerate it. And that sounds weird. And when I first found that, I thought, oh, you're dead. But actually, it works pretty well. So we refrigerate as soon as we manufacture and through distribution. But our end customer with like a 250-gallon tote, you know, that would do 500 acres usually. There's four to eight weeks to use it. So it's not ice cream. And it, it tells you when it goes bad. And so you may have you know, different experience with different products. Our product smells, you know, the founder says it's a mixture of Sam Adams and glazed donuts. Uh, we have a pound of molasses in there. It's earthy. It's sweet. When we, they grow and they use all the oxygen, it's like the bottom of your flooded field when it drains. It is the worst swamp water you ever want to smell. <laughs> and that tells you the product has been out too long. Um, our company, by the way, replaces it at our expense, no questions asked. I don't care whose fault it is. It's rare that that happens. Um, we do put sugar in there. Um, and most you know, the other products, other microbial suppliers say, you know, to use a sugar or something. Um, it's a food source because, again, the biology that's refrigerated like ours or different compost tea type products, we put food sources so as soon as they hit the ground, they can get established. And that's really important because I didn't add it to this talk, but I'm going to, you know, later in other talks, is why it's so important to have a cooperative community of microbes because they're the ones that can actually compete and establish. And, uh, and, and that's, that's really important. That's why a lot of single or a couple strain products don't work as well because they just can't compete. Okay. Um, yeah, and in addition, uh, the second part of the question is, are the results you are showing with or without conventional fertilizers? Most of the results that, that I show are with fertilizer. Um, in a lot of cases, it's going to be with less fertilizer, but a common way our particular product is applied is mixed with starter fertilizer. Uh, so that, okay. that's, that's very yeah, and as you said, it's not a, a standalone type of thing. So I would imagine you would right. be using fertilizer with most applications. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm um, sorry, this is a great point because there are a lot of people in, in, in my industry that say you won't need to use fertilizers again, especially phosphorus or potassium. You may not need to use fertilizers for a period of time, but the only nutrient that really gets added back to soil would be nitrogen, through a nitrogen-fixing bacteria, you know, through your, your soybean roots or whatever. Um, I, I see microbes as a tool to get better efficiency, but not to replace fertilizer. So okay. to me, that's a scary recommendation if someone says, oh, don't put any P or K down. First of all, there are periods where your crop, like a germinating seed, needs phosphorus now. And I've not seen a rate study that says how fast microbes release it from the ground. So I don't want to do anything that might set back the seed. You can probably use less phosphorus in a starter. Going to zero, I would really, really want to test. And you should test on your soil because it's going to be different from any soil I test on and anyone else's. So, again, this is multivariate. It's a tool in your toolbox. Okay. Uh, our next question is, can you comment on the effect of soil pH on microbial activity? Yes, yeah, so the soil um, microbes tend to like the same pH as your plants. They have a wider pH tolerance, especially when you've got a consortium of really thousands of species, you know, like in a compost tea, like in our product. So we'll have some that will survive at a very acidic pH where you would not get a crop in something very basic. Through time, Microbes will tend to bring the pH back to neutral, but they're not going to be a substitute for a lime or some other intervention. So if you can grow a crop, you're definitely going to be able to grow the microbes, you know, if, if the pH is in a range that the crop can tolerate. Perfect. That's convenient. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Um, next question is, if we are in the desert southwest where it's always dry and sometimes hot, when would be a good time to apply the product? I was thinking about it planting, but sometimes we dust we dust in so it's still hot and dry at planting. Any thoughts? 
Yeah, I, I mean, planting is the best time, but if, if, if there's not enough moisture for your seed to germinate, then the microbes are, are just going to sit there dormant. So if your crop is growing at all, then there's enough moisture for the microbes. I can tell you that um, I've got a, a lot of uh, data and customers, like in far southwest Kansas and places that are basically desert. And instead of putting everything down at planting, they'll spoon feed microbes on instead two or three times during the season because they just find in their conditions it's better. They lower the rate so they're not spending any more money. They also, uh, where they have irrigation, just apply it through the pivot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, looking at, okay, so there's a couple questions about the product, the Bio 800 Plus. Um, is this a liquid product or a solid granule or powder? <clears throat> no, excuse me. It's a liquid. <clears throat> we um, we can spray dry it on a composted manure product like chicken litter, hog manure. But, you know, like I said, microbes need moisture, so it's not as biologically diverse. It's actually more expensive. Um, I, I like the liquid, and it's the best way to use it. It does not work well as a seed treatment because, again, we're drying microbes, and it just doesn't dry well. It's tacky. So I would I'd put it down when you plant, but you, with a pre-emergent or, you know, in furrow, two-by-two, two, whatever. It's very flexible. Most microbes are. Um, but we want it as close to planting as practical. Actually, this last picture you should see in the summary is why. Those are planted at the same time. Look at the difference in emergence and root mass with biology and without. That's why you want the diverse biology as close to planting as you can, because you don't want to miss that window of getting the, the feed under the crop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, another question about the products is, do you identify what each of the 800 microbes are, and are they primarily gram-negative or gram-positive? Oh, there's a, there's a mix. Um, and actually, if you send me an email, I'll send you uh, an, a sample or, you know, one of our DNA fingerprints. We send a part of every batch out to a third-party lab because we don't have the internal capability. It's too expensive. And I'll, and I'll send you a DNA fingerprint. The label can never reflect what's actually in the product, which really frustrates me. But there's no secret. And then you can just see for yourself everything in there. Okay. Um, and this is a little bit related, but does the microbial community or diverse, does the microbial community diversity need different for different soil types? Um, and is 800 plus recommended for any soil organic matter level? Yes. And we actually uh, have made uh, 11 different products based on different soil types and climate zones. And there are some subtle differences for them, but it, any product seems to work really well anywhere we apply it. So that's kind of an admission that um, we're not smart enough to figure out if, you know, that 799th microbe really was important or not. Uh, so what we found is it works very broadly. Okay. And... Uh, another questioner has, uh, or listener, I should say, can you describe some of the differences in your products? So, you know, you mentioned you have different products. Can you go into a little oh, more detail maybe? Sure. So, uh, again, so we we start with a, a proprietary mix of only different parts of plants. So there's no animal product and in, in, in such uh, in ours. And we make a compost like you would maybe for a compost tea. But during our brew process, we're constantly changing food sources, temperatures, pH, et cetera, so we know what we amplify. So for the spring product of planting, we're amplifying for those families of microbes that are really good at inducing rooting and root hair formation and cycling nutrients. For the product to break down crop residue, we enhance for those fungi really good at breaking down cellulose and lignin. So, again, we can just tweak it based on how we produce the product. But they're all biologically very diverse. Okay. 
Um, another listener would like to know if you can go into basic use direction. Uh, and I know oh, it's sure. going to be different timing, you know, in different places, but. So um, generally speaking, with any microbial product, uh, including ours, so it, people have different rate recommendations for row crops, corn, soy, wheat, cotton, et cetera. Um, it's half a gallon an acre. It's close to planting as practical. You can mix it with a burn down. Um, when you apply any microbial, though, over the top, use enough total liquid that you wet it into the soil. So I say, you know, 15 gallons an acre, that's usually not a problem with a herbicide application, 10 really the minimum. The last thing you want with any microbe is to apply it at a really low volume so it sits on top of the ground and the sunlight can beat on it because UV light is really good at killing microbes. So we want to protect it from UV light. Um, you can tank mix because what I, I don't want is anyone to make a separate pass to put down to star product, except maybe when you're controlling crop residue. That's always a, a, a broadcast application. Again, 15 gallons to wet it in is a pretty standard recommendation. Um, a product like ours, you can mix with anything but fungicide, which of course would be counterproductive. Uh, also, if you're doing anhydrous, it's okay if you, if you put anhydrous in the fall and you apply it, you know, in furrow in the spring. Just don't put anhydrous on top of any microbe. Anhydrous is really good at sucking the water out of them and killing them. So easy to use, easy to mix. Um, the only caution is if you mix our product or another diverse one with fertilizer in your spray tank and you run into a really long weather delay, five days or more, it going to grow and it could clog and you're not going to have fun getting that product out of the out of your sprayer nothing we can do about that okay um and just to confirm another person asked is your product safe to apply with pesticides and i know you said not with fungicides but and, and so everything right. else is okay okay yes it works really well with herbicides and insecticides no problem okay um, we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, let's see. Can the product be mixed with an acid fertilizer? And if so, what is the pH range? Uh, you know, you, I'd say if you're at, at, at pH 6, um, we're okay. We have a lot of acid-producing bacteria. So a lot of the product will do really well at even lower pHs, but I'd, I'd really like to see it something that, that was a little bit higher. So the, the more than pH is salt. So the more people can use a low salt fertilizer or cut it back in their tank with some water first, again, for any microbial, high levels of salt are just not great for them. But will it kill all of them? No. I can tell you, We've had everything under the sun mixed with our product. These are self-replicating active ingredients. They recover really fast. So um, while I want you to baby it, you really don't have to. Okay. Um, a couple of people have asked about where um, 800 plus is registered for sale. And one person is asking specifically about Mexico and Latin America. So if you want to address that. No, right now we're just U.S. and Canada. Okay. So we could get Mexico, um, I think, pretty easily because North America has some pretty good harmonized rules over microbes like this. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, one person is asking, have you ever considered spray drying the microbes into a solid or powder form to extend the shelf life? Um, it actually shortens the shelf life. Uh, of, of, so some bacteria can produce an endospore that will survive a nuclear blast, but most microbes don't do that. Um, so drying is actually not good because it takes, takes the water away. We do spray dry into like a prilled chicken litter or, or hog manure because there's a little bit of moisture in there. And shelf life isn't bad, but we also know that we narrow some of the biology especially the higher life forms, the fungi, protozoa, amoeba, just don't like drying as much as bacteria. 
Okay. And one final question is, what is the function of amoebas in the nutrient release? So they're like the protozoa. So they've got that one nitrogen for 30 carbons. So they're also eating lots and lots of bacteria and fungi and, and spitting out the nutrients because it's too nutrient rich for them. So they're just part of that cycle. All right. I guess with that, we will close out the webinar. Um, if you did not get your question answered, Dave will, he has your email and your question and he can follow up with you, um, you know, shortly in the next few days, I'm sure. So um, don't worry about that. If you want to watch the presentation again, um, use the same link that you used to get on it today. You'll also get a reminder email tomorrow that will, you know, thank you for attending and it will have the link there as well. And you can always find it at croplife.com uh, croplife forward slash webinars. So I want to thank Dave especially for all of his good content today. And thank you for taking an hour out of your day to, to um, listen to the presentation. I hope you learned something. And thank you, as always, to Holganics for uh, presenting the webinar. So have a great day, everyone. Yep, thanks, everyone.